Hi, and welcome to Logic, uh, or this unit. This last module, I thought I would make a few videos just sort of to explain some of the concepts. Um, I think as we get into to, uh, natural deduction, that becomes kind of difficult uh, for students who, uh, you know, it can become very complex, but we don't go very far into it. But I think the initial part is, is just getting these translations down can be a little bit tough. So I thought I would just sort of talk a little bit about how to make translations, how to set up true tables. I would just make a series of videos to see if that would help. So basically, the way translations work is we basically, if we have a statement like uh, the dog is uh, sleeping or something like that, we, we don't wanna have the meaning here. Or if we have a statement like, like uh, you know, um, John is tall. We don't want to get, if we're going to assess the truth value of these statements, we don't want to get hung up in what these statements mean. We want to look just at the logic itself, just at that inferential claim that is in there. So if we do that, we can just take this and we can say, okay, instead of taking this whole statement, let's just symbolize that. Let's just give one letter, like the letter D. We use a capital letter and a capital letter is used to symbolize a simple statement. And so like John is tall, we just use maybe like the letter J. Or you could use the letter T. It really doesn't matter what letter you use as long as you're clear about what that means. Now, that's great if all you have is a bunch of simple statements like the dog is sleepy and John is tall. But in order to make anything meaningful or to really have any statements, you oftentimes have statements like if, you know, A then B, or you have statements like A and B, or things like that. So like something like uh, Amy and Bob are here, okay? Now what happens is, is if you have a statement like Amy and Bob are here, you're gonna wanna break out the idea that there's really two ideas there. There's a statement like Amy is here, and there's a statement Bob is here. And you want to go ahead and separate those out as two different letters, even though it's one sentence, because that's a, com a compound sentence. It, it has more meaning than just one idea. Amy is here is one idea. Amy and Bob are here is two ideas. And if you have a statement like, you know, uh, Amy, Bob, and X, Y, and Z, you know, Amy, Bob, Cindy, and David are here, you've really got four ideas that are being presented in there. So you want to make sure each one of those has its own. Because if I say A for Amy and Bob are here, and then it ends up Amy isn't here, then the whole sentence is false. Whereas all we know, we, we don't, that doesn't mean Bob isn't here, it just means Amy isn't here. Both of them are not here. So we wanna separate out the meaning of those. Now, in order to separate out, out the meaning, we need to have some symbols we can use that will allow us to, uh, to make sense of this. And so we have five logical operators we will use. And those five logical operators look like this. There's one that's just a squiggly line called a tilde. And a tilde uh, does basically the, uh, basically what a tilde does is it means no or not. Anytime you see those words, it means no or not. And it performs a function in logic we call negation. So we have the symbol, oops, symbol, name uh, operation or function, we'll call it the operation, and the translates. This is what it translates. So this is, these are kind of what it does. So anytime you have a sentence, like if you have a sentence like Amy is not here, if we were simply to symbolize that as A, then we don't really realize like, well, then what if, what if I say Amy's not here and you say, no, that's not true. Amy is here. Well, then you gotta say, then, then now you've gotta say Amy is here means tilde A and Amy is not here is A. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You need to be able to distinguish when something is both true and not true. Or somebody saying yes about saying and no about when one's making a positive statement and a negative statement. So we simply have a tilde that if you have any time you see the word no or not, you add a tilde. So this becomes tilde A. And if you say like, no dogs uh, are good, 
then you would take D for dogs are good and tilde to say no dogs are good, something like that. And I'm not suggesting no dogs are good. I'm just using that as an example. Now, what we can do is let me just erase this all out real quick. Don't want to erase it too quickly. Sorry. All right. So the next symbol we have is we have a symbol that's just like a little dot. And we write it like this, like A dot. It's not at the line. It's not like a period. It's a raised in the middle of the line B. And so what happens is, is we, um, we use that and it's called dot. And it does the job of conjunction. And what it does is it does things like and, also, but, you know, anything that's saying both of these things are true. And so, for example, if you have a statement like Amy and Bob are here, you would say Amy is here, dot, Bob is here. Now, I mentioned that it also can translate the word but, but but really at the end of the day just means and, right? I mean, it, it is saying, like if I say Amy is here, but Bob is here, right? Like maybe there's a big fight between the two of them. Maybe they absolutely hate each other and they, they never go the same place. What I'm really saying is Amy is here and Bob is here. It means the same thing, but just has an ordinary language. Sort of when I use that phrasing, it has a meaning that we oftentimes don't catch in logic that's saying, hey, uh, we, this means a little bit more than that. And so that's something to, to keep in mind that that does, um, that it does mean but as well. So, all right, the next thing we have is, eh, did not mean to do that one. Is we have one that looks just like a letter V, except we call it wedge. If you were to write this on a computer, you'd probably just use the letter V we call it wedge and it performs the function called disjunction or the operation called disjunction. Disjunction is basically just translating the idea of or. Uh, or is probably the main one you're going to have. You know, nor would be something similar, but um, it basically just translates the idea of or. And what we have with disjunction is disjunction is conjunction is bringing together, disjunction is kind of qualifying that bringing together, and wedge just to say, you say Amy or Bob is here, you would just say wedge, and that's how you would translate that. Now, the next one is what we call horseshoe. It looks kind of like a U that's been turned on its side. It looks like a horseshoe, perhaps. That's kind of where it gets its name. We call it horseshoe, and horseshoe uh, performs the idea of conditional or it also can do, uh, sometimes I'll also call it um, uh, just inference or something like that, but I, I prefer just conditional. It, it, it does the conditional idea. And what it translates is it translates the if-then statements. It also can translate sufficient condition and necessary condition. So not together, but one at a time. And so whatever you have, whenever you have an if-then statement, it's always if this, then that. Now this is not a temporal, temp, temp, temporal or a tem, time-based idea. If I go there, then I'm gonna go there. This is saying, if this happens, then this happens. And if I say, if this happens, then this happens, it means, that if A happens, B necessarily will happen. And A occurring is sufficient to cause B to occur. And so whenever B is true, uh, um, you know, A is sufficient to cause it, but it's not necessarily, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily. But anytime A is true, uh, it is, it, B necessarily will be true. If A occurs, B necessarily will be true. If B is true, a would be sufficient to just to explain B. And that's where this is, it's symbolizing this conditional relationship. 
the best thing to do, we talked about sufficient necessary conditions. And if, I, I don't know if we talked about it, but if, if you, there's a kind of a little acronym to how to do it, and that's SUN. Uh, the word SUN, S stands for sufficient, N stands for necessary, and the U in SUN is the horseshoe. So it's sort of just turning that horseshoe on its side. And it's always saying the sufficient condition, then the necessary condition. Anytime you have a statement like if A, then B, you are saying A is sufficient to cause B and B is necessarily uh, true when A is true. And you would symbolize that as A horseshoe B. But if you had a statement like A is a necessary condition for B, then we know A is the necessary condition. So if we put in that little SUN acronym, it becomes what they call the consequent, and this becomes the antecedent. So this is B horseshoe A, because A is the necessary condition, not B, A is. So that would be translated as B horseshoe A. If we change that to sufficient condition, we just change the wording on that, it would become A horseshoe B, because A is the sufficient condition, and our little SUN acronym, or whatever we want to call that, uh, that performs that, that's the sufficient conditional spot. All right. And the last one of these we learn is what we call biconditional. And biconditional is basically just making a simple statement that, you know, A horseshoe B and B horseshoe A. It's saying basically the conditional statement is going both directions, that it's both a is true and B is true. And we make, we do that, we symbolize that with a symbol called triple bar. Triple bar is just three lines. It's like an equal sign with an extra line across the top, just like that. And we call it triple bar, that's its name. And it performs the, the condition or operation of biconditional. And it basically translates statements like if and only if, or anything of that nature. Uh, it, basically, uh, if you have a statement like if and only if, that symbolizes it. Now, the only other thing I want to note about translations is this is kind of, it has to be that, or if it says it's both a sufficient and necessary condition. So if it said it's both a sufficient and necessary condition, it would also translate that. It basically is saying, that whenever one of them is true, the other one has to be true. And we call that biconditional. Now, there are a couple examples. The idea horseshoe can translate just if you have the word if and not the word then, or if you have the word only if, but not the word if and only if. It can also translate not that. Now, if, anytime you have the word if, if always signals what follows the word if is your antecedent, the part after, uh, the part that goes before the horseshoe. And the part that follows only if is always, if you have the word only if, that always signals the uh, necessary conditional, and that becomes, uh, that always goes after the horseshoe. It's called our consequent. So we have to remember that a biconditional state or a, a horseshoe statement is always antecedent horseshoe consequent. And so, whenever we, and those are kind of important terms to make sure you remember. And whenever you have the word if, it always signals the antecedent. And if you have the word only if, or the word necessary conditional, it signals the consequent. Now, why is it? If I said a statement like, uh, I will be there only if Joe is there, um, then Joe being there is going to be our consequent. So it'll be, you know, I am there, horseshoe, Joe is there. What that's saying is I will be there only if Joe is there, is saying if I'm there, then Joe is there, right? Because I'm there only if Joe is there. Joe being there is a necessary condition for me to be there. So if I am there, then Joe will be there. I won't be there if he isn't, but I will be there if he is. And so that's where that comes in, is it's saying the part after is not causing me to be there. The part after there will be true if I am there. And that's kind of one of the things that becomes a little bit tricky about if then in logic is it's not saying, well, if you go, then I'll go. It's saying, I'm going only if you go, is saying, 
my being there means that you went. My being there, I am there, I am there, only if you are there, right? I said Joe will just put the letter U. I am there only if you are there. Uh, so that becomes that, and that's where that's meaning. Now, all this said, let me erase real quick this last line here, or this bottom part, um, is if you are about to begin this, before you start translating or doing anything else, I would write this out on a piece of paper. And I would memorize this. If, we were, if I was teaching this in the classroom, I would give you the first day after I went over this, the next day, I would expect you to come in and I would give you something that just had five lines and had four boxes across, looked like that, and I would expect you to fill that in. Because the quickest and easiest way for you to remember this is you need to know the name, you know what it does, and you know what it translates in a very rough idea. Because that will help you all throughout the rest of the semester to know this. So I would recommend that even though I'm not going to quiz you over this, because it's kind of hard to do a quick quiz like this outside of the classroom, um, I would like for you to do that, and I would recommend you do that, and that will help you. I would study it and maybe give yourself the quiz and that will go a long way to helping you with your translations and make it a lot quicker for you to understand everything going forward. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to come back and give one more video for this week, and then I will, uh, I will talk some more after that. So um, if anybody has any questions,